Hi, viewers. Another episode of Guest with Nazir. It's a great honor for me. Today's honorable guest is a member of the House of Lord, one and only Lord Nazir Ahmed of Rotherham. Welcome in our show. Thank you very much, and thank you for your kind introduction. Lord Ahmed, please tell our viewers about your childhood and your early days. Uh, my childhood hasn't ended yet. Uh, I'm still going through uh, those phases. Uh, I was born in Azad Kashmir. I uh, went to local school in Mirpur. Uh, and then uh, I came to the UK. I came to Rotherham, actually, uh, back in 1969, end of 1969. Uh, I went to local school here and then Thomas Rotherham College, where I was elected student president of Thomas Rotherham College. And then later I was uh, elected as the first uh, uh, Asian councillor on Rothenburg Council. I was the youngest magistrate appointed uh, in 1992. Uh, and then in 1998, Alhamdulillah, I was the first Muslim appointed in the House of Lords. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a lot of first, but it's been challenging. Nothing is so easy. And uh, Alhamdulillah, so far, uh, Allah has protected me and there's been many, many challenges, but uh, I'm still here. So coming from a very humble background and reaching to the, uh, a great uh, parliament. So have you ever thought about it that one day you will be a member House of Lords? No, uh, no, I never thought that I would become a member of the House of Lords. In fact, I never thought that I would uh, even be elected as a councillor. Uh, my uh, aim was, in fact, to be honest with you, in those days when I first uh, came to the UK, uh, many of our parents and our first generation, they worked in steel factories or they worked in uh, uh, textile mills uh, and they made sure that they fed as well, so we become strong lads, and then we would work in the steel factories too. Uh, I remember when I was at school and then I went to uh, college, um, the, uh, 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 those advisors, uh, you know, the, uh, the ones who advise you on education and also employment, um, local authority advisors came to see me and he uh, gave me advice and he said that uh, I think you should become a motor mechanic or electrician uh, and then you will get a job. And I really wasn't interested. I wanted to pursue A-levels and then go for degree. And uh, so I, we never, you know, nobody in my family had been to university. So nobody uh, was encouraging me to go to university or do business even. Uh, because one of the first things that I did was uh, to start my own business. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we did well. We had chain of shops, fish and chip shops, petrol stations, uh, and then moved in. Look, uh, you know what's been in the news recently. Uh, those two lads from Blackburn who worked in a petrol station in Dewsbury, and now they bought uh, Asda's for six point something billion pounds. Uh, I'm not as successful as them, uh, but uh, I can tell you Saranwar Parvez, he started with uh, uh, a job in the uh, transport uh, service. He was a bus conductor, then bus driver. Then he had a small butcher's shop and then he opened up a chain of shops and chain of cash and carries and then Best Waste Cement, UBL, many other businesses. So Alhamdulillah, there are, if you are willing to work, uh, Allah will help you if you're working hard and honest. Uh, and then in this country, you can succeed. You don't have to look up or look back and say, well, you know, my grandfather left me this or my father left me this. Uh, and that's why I'm running this business. No, you can start, you can do it yourself. And inshallah, Allah will help you and you can be successful. Lord Ahmed, this generation presently have a uh, luxury of facilities, college, universities, parents are backing them up. But your generation where parents were working full time, they were working in shifts, but still they were focusing on the education of the children. So why the, this young generation is not doing well as your generation did well? So what are the main reasons? Nazir Avansab, 
you know, uh, diaspora communities, wherever they are, uh, the first generation works very hard. And that's my father's generation who came here. Uh, they didn't have uh, cars. They didn't have the luxury of uh, uh, sort of uh, central heating and uh, warm clothes. They worked very hard to get us uh, into schools and fed us and uh, housed us. Uh, many of those uh, first generation people, they lived together, uh, overcrowded, uh, you know, properties uh, with the 20, 30 people sleeping on floors. There were beds that never became cold. Let me give you an example. My father rented a bed uh, in Maidenhead and uh, my father was on night shift and my brother was on uh, day shift. Uh, so they didn't need central eating because the bed was warm all the time. There was somebody sleeping there. So in those days, people worked hard. And so we had seen that. And uh, so my mother, uh, when she came here, she uh, left us uh, in the UK, went back to Pakistan because uh, my sister was in education in uh, girls only school uh, education. Uh, and there wasn't, uh, they were all mixed schools here. Uh, at that time, so uh, she went back. Um, but um, I uh, cooked, I cleaned, I went to school, and then I used to go to masjid. Uh, and I used to learn the Quran uh, off by heart, uh, uh, hits from uh, Qadi Siddiq Saab, may Allah give him long life, wonderful teacher, wonderful Qari, and wonderful uh, scholar. Uh, so uh, uh, Nazira Mansab, you know, I, I think it's because we had gone through this process of hard work and also uh, we had seen how other people lived in poverty. Uh, whereas uh, children today, I mean, they would never, you would never think, they would never dream of uh, lighting up a fire in their house uh, with uh, fire, you know, fire lighters was a luxury. So it was uh, either newspapers or wood and you uh, sort of lit it and then you used to blow on it and you, you had coal uh, and uh, so the room, so there was dust all over, uh, you had to clean it up. You, uh, in those days, we didn't so have- So it's a free, free fireworks then? Well, well it, not so much. Uh, we didn't have a, a fridge. So we used to have a delivery of chickens, live chickens, and we used to put them in the uh, basement in cellar and uh, then we used to uh, uh, get them cleaned and uh, uh, sort of like uh, boil them. Uh, and all week we just had those boiled uh, chickens uh, because we didn't have a fridge. We used to leave, leave everything in the basement because that was the coldest place in the house. So, you know, things were different. These days, kids take things for granted. Uh, you never had ice cream or ice lollies in your fridge. You didn't have, well, you didn't have a fridge. Uh, so a lot of luxuries came later on in life. Uh, and these kids don't know uh, how uh, we struggled. And it's not only me or the Asian community. Uh, English uh, families did the same. Look, many people, uh, in fact, majority of the people that I know didn't have uh, hot running water. We didn't have uh, uh, bathrooms or shower in the house. Uh, baths were in the basement. And so, uh, you know, when we first, and, and these are just the tub. Uh, and so people took a bucket in there. And uh, uh, some of my English friends, they tell us that uh, uh, they used to have hot uh, uh, a, a, a tub and uh, two or three people would bath in the same water. Uh, we didn't have that. Uh, we had a, a outside toilet and there was a little room next to it where we would take a, a bucket of water uh, and you would pour the uh, water uh, with lota or with some container uh, and have a shower. So, you know, life wasn't easy. And uh, uh, we, we worked hard and that's why there was an incentive for us at the end. Lord Ahmed, uh, please tell our viewers, a boy came from a very poor background, from all the way from Mirpur Azad Kashmir. When he reaches the very first day, the House of Parliament, 
So what was your joy and what was your feeling? Please express your feelings and those moments and share with, with us. Well, there's a, there's a journey uh, because uh, when the announcement was made, uh, before the announcement, uh, Downing Street uh, called me and told me that uh, I would be appointed to the House Laws for Life. Um, so the first thing you do is you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, the uh, trust and the uh, privilege he has given you. Of course, you thank Her Majesty the Queen and the society that also have given you uh, this uh, honor uh, of becoming the first Muslim and becoming a member of the House of Lords. Uh, but the feeling, uh, I really don't know because uh, many of the times I didn't believe that I was uh, that person that was appointed in the House of Lords. You know, it was almost like uh, feeling uh, there was some sort of mistake. Let me give you an example. I walked into the uh, peers entrance and the, uh, uh, the gentleman in the peers entrance uh, with the morning uh, dress, uh, uh, the uh, doorkeeper, uh, he said, good morning, my lord. And quite honestly, I thought he was uh, talking to somebody else. And I slowly looked uh, behind me to see if there was somebody else uh, who was addressed as me, Lord. Uh, and then I realized it's me. So every time it's a privilege to be in the House of Lords and to serve as a member of the House of Lords. So Lord Ahmed, uh, you have seen the uh, all patches of politics in United Kingdom. Now UK is going through, uh, I will say, a very historical moment because after Second World War, the biggest change in political system is coming out of the EU. And now, and the second phase, we are at the same time going to start the possible litigation with the EU. How you see these changes and what, uh, what will be the effects of it on a life of a common man? Do you know, I, I, I was in the UK uh, before 1974, before we went into uh, European Union, uh, the common market. Uh, so I know um, even after that, uh, I know those difficult times uh, when um, uh, it, it, when uh, Harold Wilson and uh, uh, Ted Heath uh, had a huge uh, uh, political struggle between the, uh, those difficult times when we had strikes, those difficult times uh, when uh, Britain went to International Monetary Fund for, uh, for help out uh, because uh, we had so much loan we couldn't pay, repay. Uh, I remember those uh, power cuts. Uh, we didn't have enough electricity, so they used to get to you just like in Pakistan, they have a power uh, cut uh, for one hour, two hour. We used to. Uh, I remember those horrible times when we had, uh, uh, you know, strikes and. Uh, dustbins were not emptied for weeks. And so, uh, you know, uh, unemployment and even inflation, 15% interest rate at 16%. Uh, so I've seen all that. I don't think that we are going to go back to those uh, times. I th my own view is, uh, I think that although uh, we will come out of the European Union, we will come out of the European market, uh, I think uh, there will be special arrangements uh, for trade. Uh, Europe needs uh, Britain as much as we need uh, uh, Europe. Probably we need more, but we've got more opportunities. Uh, already uh, our government is lining up uh, business uh, with America and also uh, with Asia, with Commonwealth countries. Uh, so I don't see a big uh, change, uh, other than the fact that there's excitement in the media. Um, you know, I mean, we heard, uh, we heard, all of us heard, even uh, when COVID-19 started last year, when um, uh, we thought that uh, uh, we were going to, well, this year, early this year, sorry, that we were going to run out of food and we would, we would uh, stock up and, you know, there was no food left in the supermarkets, prices went up. This was all because of the panic. Uh, I think we should uh, remain content. Uh, inshallah, things will get better. Uh, I personally think uh, that uh, uh, a long run, we will do better. 
uh, workers may not have the same rights because uh, uh, there was more protect protection for uh, workers uh, through European Union. Uh, but I think that there were a lot of bad things that came up from uh, came over from European Union too: racism, fascism, Islamophobia. Uh, if you look at some of the political parties, whether they're uh, Pagida in Germany, whether the uh, the National Front uh, in uh, France or in uh, Austria, uh, and uh, Gert Wilders in uh, the Netherlands, many many others. You could go list go uh, through a list of those fascist fascist movements in European Union. And, uh, and you can see some of the reflection, actually recent polls show uh, that, that about 50% uh, of the conservative members think uh, that Islam is not compatible uh, with the British values. Uh, I'm glad that that's not the majority of the British public, uh, but it all came across from European Union. So I think there are cert certain things, uh, you know, we look, if we go back to the 1976 Race Relations Act and the Equalities Act and the protection we have in law in the United Kingdom, it's been there much before than any other European country. Whereas in Europe, uh, everything uh, is uh, free floating and sadly, uh, there isn't a European wide law that can protect us. Uh, so in my view, I think we would do better. We will do better, inshallah, uh, when we're out of the European Union. In 1998, you joined the House of Lords. Same year, a very important piece of legislation was introduced in the United Kingdom, the Human Rights Act. It was a very important piece of legislation. Now people will write a one, lose one important right that they can't go to the European Court of Human Rights. How you see this change? It will affect a lot of people or not? I know I, it will affect uh, a lot of people and it may also affect me. Um, but I think uh, we are not coming, I think it is a difference in European uh, human rights law and the European Court of Human Rights. The one in Strasbourg, uh, there are many countries who are not part of the European Union, but who are still uh, signatory and also have access to the European uh, Court of Human Rights. So uh, whilst uh, the government keeps threatening that they will pull out of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, I don't think there's been any real commitment. Uh, in, in any case, uh, there are many things that uh, we don't have any clarity yet um, because the rights of uh, uh, those uh, European citizens who are working in this country and the, those uh, British citizens who are living in uh, Spain, for instance, in France, in, in many parts of Southern Europe, uh, who don't want to come back home. They still want to be paid their pension. They've given their life to Britain. They have the right uh, to return, but they don't want to return, but they want to receive their pensions and uh, they want to live that life. And so all these things need to be sorted out. And of course, the very crucial and very difficult uh, question of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland uh, and whether this will bring conflict again if we try to uh, uh, sort of uh, move away from uh, our commitments made in Good Friday Agreement. Lord Ahmed, uh, you have worked for the international human rights and especially you have raised voice for the voice of voiceless people. And especially when we talk about the history of Kashmir conflict, you have raised so many concerns. Recently, India has made the biggest change that they have changed its status. So what was your say on it and what the international community should do on it? Well, I, I'm, I've been consistent because um, this uh, abrogation of uh, 370 and also 35A is very clearly a breach of international law. Uh, you could not uh, uh, break agreement between uh, those two, where, especially when you have uh, uh, the UN resolutions of 1948 and 49, uh, which say that uh, uh, the uh, final decision on Kashmir should be made through free, fair and impartial plebiscite. Now, what this... Uh, 
uh, breach uh, this uh, abrogation of 370 means is that there was an agreement between the Kashmiri leadership and also uh, the government in Delhi. Uh, so what they've done is they've actually ripped it all up uh, in uh, one uh, stroke with one stroke of pen. Uh, so there is now there India becomes an occupational force. Uh, and 35A, uh, you know, the abrogation of 35A, which um, a, is Bashinda uh, Riyasat, uh, the uh, uh, status uh, which was given to them through Maharaja Hari Singh's 1926 law, uh, that you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, bring in uh, Hindus from all of India like. Uh, uh, Indian government is trying to do is former soldiers, they want to uh, settle them. It's like uh, the settlements in uh, West Bank in Palestine uh, and to change the demographics. Uh, so when, uh, inshallah, there's uh, uh, a, a free, fair and impartial plebiscite, uh, that they could uh, change the demo demographics. And also, even before then, actually, they want to push out the Kashmiris um, and uh, use intimidation and violence, uh, which they do on a regular basis. Uh, uh, Kashmiris, uh, young people, there are thousands of young people who are still missing from uh, last uh, August, uh, who were taken away from their homes and taken to uh, other parts of India. They uh, have lost uh, uh, many, uh, well, we have lost many of our sisters. Uh, we don't know where they've taken, the, it, it's a, you know, we know that uh, rape uh, is uh, used for as a war crime, uh, but uh, again, 300 uh, women we know it's reported uh, who have been taken from their homes for the pleasures of Indian soldiers, but there is much more, uh, no, you no, know. No. Sorry for interruption. The United Nations and the international community, why there are double standards? Because if there is a certain country is doing something, their voice is different. But if a, a country which is economically strong or they have economic interests, then their voice is different. So why there are double standards? Uh, well, you should ask that to international community and the UN. Uh, but I think on this particular occasion, the uh, international community has many of its own problems. For instance, right now, uh, there are elections in the United States. Uh, the, right now, uh, because of COVID-19, there are many economic challenges. And that also means challenges in India, by the way, because uh, uh, Indian economy is down 23.5%. Uh, the world economy is down by many points, uh, so from anything from 10 to 25%. Uh, so uh, there are economic challenges. There's a war going on between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia as we speak. Uh, there was war going on between Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine. There is a war going on in Palestine. And uh, uh, also uh, you see what, is, uh, what India and this fascist government of India, the BJP and RSS, what they've been doing to minorities uh, in India in terms of, uh, you know, uh, rape and torture and killings uh, and uh, the CAA, which is uh, uh, taking the rights of uh, more than 200 million Muslims, uh, but also uh, how India is behaving with its neighbors, neighbors, whether it's China, Nepal, uh, whether it is Bangladesh. Uh, they're at war with all of these countries, including- Lord Ahmed, you, you mentioned about the China. So- what is your say? The Muslims in China, especially Uyghur Muslims, are facing very difficult times. And even recently, uh, the mainstream media in this country has shown different documentaries where people have been uh, kept in the concentration camps and the torch has been used. So have you raised any concern? And what is your say, and especially uh, your other fellow member House of Lords? Uh, Uyghur Muslims uh, issue has been right at the forefront for me. I wrote to uh, the uh, Chinese uh, ambassador here uh, nearly uh, just over two years ago when I first got to know uh, what was happening. Uh, when we saw the horrible photos of uh, mosques being demolished and uh, uh, 
Uh, then I raised the issue of uh, something like 58 uh, Pakistani Muslims who were married to Chinese women, their children and their wives were uh, uh, abducted and they were taken away. Uh, and then uh, we've seen uh, these concentration camps with over a million people who are kept. I regularly, if you go through my Twitter account, yeah, I regularly tweet uh, uh, the horrible uh, videos and films that come out of there, uh, but I raised it with the Chinese authority. I don't have uh, access to the president of China, but I certainly do raise, I get criticism by the way, from the uh, Pakistani uh, uh, community because uh, in Pakistan, because they think that China is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, but I, I don't honestly look, whatever difference you have with the West, whatever difference you have with the United States of America and uh, United Kingdom and Europe, uh, there is rule of law and people will not go beyond a certain uh, level. Uh, whereas in China, you are struggling to get any information. And when you do, you will find that uh, some of the things that even the Nazis didn't do, they are doing to these uh, uh, Uyghur Muslims. And, uh, uh, you know, I can go, I can do, give you a list and I can send you the letter that I wrote to the Chinese ambassador and he wrote, of course, he told lies. And of course, he said everything was all right. And this was propaganda, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which I don't believe. Uh, I know, I know there's an international politics behind it. I am not naive to know that the, uh, America and Europe, uh, they want to have a go at China because China is, is virtually uh, the second uh, powerful most country in the world with the economy and its military might. Uh, and what is about to happen in South China in terms of militarily, some of the islands that China has created and India uh, showing its muscle down there as well. But quite frankly, I'm also scared of, what's, uh, of what they're doing to Muslim communities, Yuga Muslims. Lord Ahmed, uh, it was a pleasure to have you in my show. In coming days, uh, we will invite you again, but thank you very much for joining me. Viewers, this was our respected guest, Lord Nazir Ahmed of Radharam. Keep watching Sheffield Live and keep watching Gaspar Nazir. Thank you very much. Thank you.